First one of those I've ever had. Okay, so we come to church, and sometimes when we come, the pastor or whoever, the teacher or whatever, talks about something we need to do. Okay? Well, this week we're going to look at something just a little different, because what I want to talk about is you already do it anyway. But I don't think you should. Now, when you're a little kid, you learn to your parents or your siblings or somebody taught you how to tie your shoe. They, somebody taught you how to tie a bike. Went to school. You were taught how to write. But when it comes to worry, no one sat us down and said, Now listen, this is how you worry. Okay? No one ever did that. We just sort of, and, the, and, and some of us, are extremely good at this. In fact, I want to divide it into levels. If you want to know just how good a worrier you are, I had a lady say to me one time, you know, I worry that I worry too much. I said, you're a professional. All right, so worrying is like sitting in a rocking chair. See, I could do this all day long. And at the end of the day, you could leave and you could come back. Guess what? I'm still here. I'm, I'm exercising. I'm moving stuff. But I'm not moving. And that's what worry does. Worry is something you can do. In fact, most of us do it best at night. That's when we're really good at it. And, but at the end, we, we don't come any closer it doesn't help you. Um, there's, there's no, none that I've seen, an exercise program when they say, okay, find a rocking chair. It's your first step. No, because you know you're not going anywhere. Now, I'm, I'm not critical of rocking chairs. I've got two on my front porch. I've got this one in my garage, so I, I like rocking chairs. But when it comes to worry, we've got to stay out of this worry chair. And we want to talk about that this morning and just give you some ideas of worry. And in the middle of the longest sermon recorded in the Bible by Jesus in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, right in the middle, Jesus says this in Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. <clears throat> Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his life by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin their own thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like some of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown in the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? Oh, you of little faith. So, don't worry. Saying, what will we eat, what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble. Of its own. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for this sermon that Jesus preached and just to look at some of the words. And Lord, let it just go deeply into our heart and our life and let us leave here different than when we came. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's try to, first of all, understand worry. Okay, let's try to understand what we're talking about. First of all, 
the word worry used three times in this passage, its original meaning literally meant to choke. To choke. You are, you are choking yourself, which is, first of all, very unreasonable. Doesn't make much sense to do that. In fact, you know, people don't strangle themselves. It just, it's, it's too hard to do. But yet, we'll choke things in our life. We'll miss out on opportunities. We'll miss out on, on God's blessing. And it, a lot of it has to do with how we worry so much. I was counseling a guy one time, and he was, he was a champion. He was up in the upper class of worriers. And um, he came back one time and said, you know, Pastor, I, I think I figured it out. That's okay. What did you figure out? He said, well, about 75 to 80 percent of all the things I worry about never happen. I go, great. So what's your takeaway? He goes, I've just got to worry about different things. I said, no, no, that's not the takeaway. So. First of all, it is unreasonable. It's unnatural, by the way. It creates all sorts. I'm not a doctor. Um, not that kind of doctor anyway. And, but it creates all sorts of medical issues in your system by all the stuff that happens. Um, and it's unnecessary. It doesn't, as we said, get you any closer to a solution. In fact, in these short verses, Jesus says three times, don't worry. Don't worry. Now, so we ask the question, so how can we stop? That pastor, that sounds great. So how can we stop? Well, I don't know where you were in 1994, but I had three little kids. And when this movie came out, we went. It's called Lion King. And of course, one of my favorite songs in there is Hakuna Matata which is actually Swahili for no troubles, no worries. You know, and if you, you can, in your mind now, play that song, what a wonderful face, Akuna Matata, it's not a passing craze. It means no worries for the rest of my days. So how will we stop? The world wants to say, ah, just sing a song or... Change your attitude or, you know, something, go, go buy a car or take a vacation. That's what they want you to do. Okay? Now, I love the song, but singing the song doesn't help me to stop worrying, to be honest. Okay? Um, so, I want to take out of this passage three things that will help you and I. And so, you need to know there's not a person who stands up here, whether it's your pastor or a guest speaker or whatever, that is not spent a lot of time thinking this through and a lot of time all week long thinking about, do I really do this? I don't want to be the guy that comes in here and says, um, do as I say, not as I do. So this is good for me to be reminded of this from this passage. And so there's three things. So let's look at the first one. Okay. The first one is found in the beginning when he says in verse 26, consider the birds of the sky. In other words, look around. Now, some of you may have glasses. I have regular glasses. I have sunglasses, depending on the situation. But they help me look around. And sometimes... Um, I can't find these. And I think, you know, if I had my glasses, I could find them. But sometimes just, you know, cleaning them, change the glass, it brings everything into focus. So the first thing he tells us. So this is number one. Okay. How will you stop? Next slide. There you go. Look around. That's what Jesus tells those people. Look around, consider. And so Jesus said, look around. And when he did that, he was trying to get people to see what God had already done. 
how God had blessed, how God had provided. And he uses the birds and he uses the flowers for us, you know. So the command is very clear. He says it three times. Don't worry. But his illustrations are something that we can understand, just like we can understand glasses. To, to see things, he wants us to see things differently. You know, COVID took away a lot of our choices. It really did. I mean, and we had to do things totally different, and some of them never came back. Okay, But one thing that was, wasn't taken away then, it can't be taken away tomorrow. You still get to choose your attitude. Every day, you get to choose your attitude. That's one choice you get to make every morning. And so this looking around is, I'm going to choose my attitude. I'm going to look around. And I'm going to see what God has done in my life. I'm going to see what he's done in other people's lives. I'm going to see how God answers prayer. I'm going to see how God provides. And he wants us to look around because when we look around, then we focus on what God has done. There was a, years ago up in Ohio, there was a guy who was a football coach at a real small school. The, uh, the stadium where he coached uh, held about 10,000 people. And he did really well, and so the big school in Ohio um, offered him a job, and so he goes up there, and he, and he comes up to look. Here's this stadium that holds, at that time, 60-something thousand people, which was more than ten to, six times bigger than what he had came from. And he's walking out on the field, and his mind is saying, how can I do this? I'm, I, you know, there's so many people here. And his 10-year-old son, he would say later, said to him, Dad, are you worried? He said, well, son, that's a lot of seats. It's a lot of people. And his son said this, Dad, the football field's the same size. It's all in how you look at it. And that's why Jesus says, hey, look around. Consider. Now, you remember, he's sitting outside. He's got a crowd of people. And so he takes the things that people can see. They can see flowers. They're outside. They can see birds. They're outside. He takes very common stuff. And so I'm suggesting to you that the first thing you do to limit your time in the worry chair is to look around. Look around. And look for the things that God has provided. Secondly, is, he says, to look above. All right, so... I'm the guy that loves show and tell, by the way. Okay, so sometimes with our problems, we look and we see and they're kind of small, okay? But then, if we look at them long enough, they get bigger. And nothing's really changed other than the way we look at them. And so then they get even bigger. Okay, and we're still looking at them, and we're making them bigger all the time. We're not looking to, to see what God can do. We're looking to see what we can do, and then they get so big. Can you imagine playing tennis with this thing? It'll probably break your racket. Yeah, you're right. But the point is, he says... In this passage, so your father knows what you need. So he says, look above. Don't look at your stuff and, and make it grow. No. Look, first of all, to God for your salvation, your relationship with him. When I was 19 years old, someone asked me for the first time that I can ever remember, are you a Christian? And I said, hey, of course I am. I believe in God. I live in America. What else do I need? And so he took me to this passage in the Bible, in John chapter 3, where Jesus had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with probably the most religious man that he ever had one-on-one. -on -one. And in John chapter 3, Jesus, this guy, didn't want other people to know he was coming to Jesus, so he did it at night. 
because he was a guy who had the Old Testament almost memorized because that was required for his job. So he knew everything, but he knew he needed something different. And he came to Jesus, and Jesus began to explain to him, listen, I know you're religious, but this is not about religion. It's about a relationship. And when I encourage you to look above, it's, it's not the simple thing, don't look at the, you know, the big man upstairs. I, that's not what I'm talking about, okay? I know that sounds cutesy, not something that I say. But I do know he is above. And I do know I look to him, and I do know in this story, that's what Jesus wanted Nicodemus to do. And that's why in a private conversation, not this sermon that we're in, where there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people, Jesus chose to say the most important verse in the whole Bible to one person. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he did that because he wanted us even today to see it's about a relationship. And that's why he chose that moment to share with Nicodemus. And so the first thing we look to God for when we look above is we look to him first of all and make sure we have that relationship. In the next chapter, John 4, he has a conversation with maybe the, the most sinful person one-on-one, -on -one, the lady at the well. But he points her to the same thing. It's about a relationship. And that's where I want to point you. That's where it all begins. If you don't have that, it's not based... You're obviously a religious person because it's Sunday morning and you're in church. Okay? Or you're watching at home. So you have some... But I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about a relationship. So the most important thing you can do when you look above is make sure that relationship. But also, when you look, when you look above, you need to look to God to supply what you need. You need to look, not only for your salvation, but for God to supply what you need. You see, there's one thing that you'll never hear in heaven someday. You'll never hear... God or anybody else say, oh, I never thought that would happen. See, nothing surprises God. It says here, God knows what you need. But we should look to him for that need. And he says also, not only should we look to him for our salvation, to supply our needs, but also this is where we serve him. He says, seek Ye first, the kingdom of God. What we put first, okay? Our priorities matter. We don't have to create a list. I, I'm a list guy, so I do a list every day. And, and just to show you how addicted I am to lists, I do them on my phone, I do them on paper. But the first thing I always put on my list, make a list. You know why? Because then when I get to the bottom, I can scratch something off. I ain't even moved out of my chair. And I got one knocked off. All right. So, but for us, we need to look above to God for these things. And not spend our time in the worry chair. Not looking for a better rocker. Not looking, hey, let's stop at Cracker Barrel. They got rockers. No. We need to look above. We need to look above and understand that that's what's important. Okay. Um, is an interesting story in the book of Hebrews. We won't have time to look at it. It's a whole other sermon about it said that Moses was able to follow God because he saw him who was invisible. That's an interesting thought. Because that's what we're asked to do, is to look above. And just like those people that ran out at 9.30 to watch that space launch, they were looking above. They got to see something. Okay? I mean, I was a pastor in Orlando when the shuttle used to go off. And if it went off on Wednesday night or something, I mean, we just stop and everybody run in the parking lot. 
because I know that's what they were thinking about, so I might as well just, can't beat them, join them. All right, we'll come back. I don't know that all of them came back, but, but the point I'm trying to make in all this is that when we look above, I realize we're not looking at a picture or just some clouds, but the Bible tells us that we can see he who is invisible. Because it's just like the wind, just like he described in John 3 to, to Nicodemus. He said, it's like the wind. You don't know where it came from. You don't know where it went, but you can see what it did. And that's the way God is when we look above. We can see. And so we need to look above. The third and final bit of advice I have for you is to look ahead. Okay. I'll make sure my clock says what that clock says. Okay. All right. So look ahead. Look ahead. You see, there is a clock that we all... In fact, in our world, there is no way possible that you can say, I don't even know what time it is. I mean, it's everywhere. I mean, in, a, in my kitchen, we have one on the microwave. We have one on the stove. We have several on the wall. We have them on our watch. We have them on our phone. We have them on our TV. We have them in our car. They're, they're everywhere. Now, some people, theirs is only right six months out of the year, okay, because they don't know how to change them. So, hey, they just, hey, six months, it'll be right, you know. I, I've always said even a broken clock is, is, is accurate twice a day, right? Even if it doesn't work at all. But, but when we look ahead, sometimes we try to worry about ahead. We try to worry about tomorrow. And he says in here, don't worry about it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Because, you see, I'm already there. Psalm 37 said, commit, says, commit your way to the Lord. Wait for him. Because he's there. He's already there. He knows what your tomorrow brings. And also, worrying today is not going to change tomorrow. Not at all. Not at all. And, and sometimes it causes us to create the mentality, well, there's, there's, there's no future. Today's so bad, tomorrow's going to be any worse. No. God's already there. He's got this. He's got this. And so, it's interesting. Um, there's a document that I found recently online. I'm a big history person, but it was dated 1889. And it was from an office, a department of the government that had presented this letter um, to Congress. And they wanted Congress to basically close that department. They were sending, a, in an essence, their own death letter to this because they said, uh, we believe there'll be no further need for this office. Okay, this was uh, 1889. You know what office that was? The Office of Patents. In 1889, some guy thought that there wouldn't be anything new ever come. Boy, he'd be surprised, right? Okay. But you and I know that, you know, we can race ahead in our mind about, oh, you know. And I understand when we, you know, when we have to wait like between we do a test at the doctor and we got to wait for the results. Oh, man, that is absolutely miserable. Because you get to slice up every moment of that time with every possible scenario. And most of them are the worst case. So when we get to this point, and we get to this point and we're trying to do this, just just be reminded. Okay? Let me just summarize what I've said. So, first of all, we look around. I think I had another slide, I think. So what? There it is. Okay. Okay. All right. So what? So what have I said? I said, 
Look around, look above, and look ahead. All with the idea that you're not going to worry, but you're going to look around you to see what God has done. You're going to look above to see what God can do, and you're going to look ahead to, to see where God is because he's already there. So we need to trust God and not worry. So, there was a, a guy that made his living selling photographs to magazines and websites, and they were always dramatic. It was always like a natural disaster, house fire, just something, you know. He was always, he lived out in California, he had a friend, he worked for uh, a, a, a big company in L.A., and he called him one day and said, hey, you know, the fires are burning and up north of here, and we need some good pictures. You think you could do it? He goes, yeah, yeah. So he says, okay. Um, so he gets out a map, figures out, and so he's driving all these little roads, and suddenly, you know, he's out of cell phone coverage. He feels like he's in the middle of nowhere, and he comes around this road, and he's trying to get close to the fire because he can see in the distance the smoke, but there are two big dump trucks across the road. So he gets out and says, what's going on? He said, oh, the fire jumped the road, that workers told him. This road's closed. And he said, well, no, I need to get there and take a picture. And the guy says, hey, this road's closed. So he turns around, goes back into this little town, and he sees a little restaurant. So he goes in there and asks them, do you have, like, a phone that I could use? And they go, yeah, we have one in the back. So he went back there, and he called his friend in L.A. and he explained the situation. The guy says, stay right where you are. So... Time went by, about 45 minutes an hour, and finally the old guy in the back came back and says, is there a Larry here? Somebody's calling for you. He goes, yeah, yeah. So he runs back there and takes the call, and his friend says, listen, I've made arrangements in the next little town. There's a little airport, and I've made arrangements for you to get up in a plane, and then you can take the pictures from the air. Makes all the sense in the world. So he jumps in his car, goes flying. Sure enough, he comes around a corner, and there's that airport. And sure enough, there's a couple of small airplanes, but standing by one is a guy, and he's doing what pilots do, you know, they're checking everything. So he came running, he grabbed his camera bag, and he threw it in the back seat. And this was just a two-seater, you know, small airplane. And so um, he said, let's go. And the pilot said, okay, let's go. So he jumps in, they start up, take off down the runway, and they get up, and they're talking to each other on the headsets, and the the photographer says now here's what I need you to do I need you to get real close over there by the fire drop down about 100 feet and tilt the plane this way and then when we come back I want you to tilt it the other way but stay about 100 feet above and the pilot says okay now why would I want to do that and he said well because I got to get the plane tilted so the wings aren't in the picture and I got to get close enough but I don't want to get too close I don't want the smoke to shift and you know and, but I, and, and then if you turn it the other way, I can try that angle because I need, need these pictures. So the pilot says, um, so are you telling me you're a photographer? And the guy said, of course I am. And so then the pilot says this. So you mean you're not my instructor? <laughs> now think about it. The pilot, a student pilot, thought that that guy was an experienced pilot. That guy, who was a photographer, thought this guy was the experienced pilot. And they were both wrong. Just in case anybody worries, they safely made it back, okay? That's how I know what happened, because this guy told the story. So, so I want to leave that thought with you. Who are you trusting? Who are you trusting when you worry? When you get in that worry chair and you get there and you start to go at it. I mean, you're, you, you may even be like that lady. You worry about your worrying. You need to trust God and not yourself. Don't trust your bank account. Don't trust your finances. Don't, don't trust your vehicle. Don't trust anything but God because he's got this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much 
for this morning. And I know in a time like this, there's situations in this room that are big. I mean, there's people that are dealing with cancer. There's people that are dealing with um, grief. There are people that are dealing with just big things. And so, Lord, we're not making light of that. And we're not even asking for us to think about them to be not big. But we are asking that you would help us to see you bigger. Bigger than anything that comes our way. Lord, help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.